right, everybody. Uh, it's 635. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to switch my screen here. Uh, feel free to turn your cameras off if you want until we have um, some social time again. And we'll also have Q&A uh, after our guest speakers. Um, and please remain muted throughout the presentations. So I'm going to get set up here. All right. Let's go. All right, so thank you again for coming to the Metro Phoenix Ecoflora year two celebration. Uh, again, please remain muted. We are gonna record this and post it to our YouTube channel. Uh, I am Jenny Davis. I'm the coordinator for the project. Also here with me tonight to help out is Ariona, the program director of the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance. Uh, I'm excited to see you all and share with you. I feel like it's been a long time. Uh, we're going to start off with Ecoflora updates followed by our guest speakers, and then we'll have a closing, and I welcome you to stay for some social time and games. So let's get started. So what is Ecoflora? I already asked uh, if anyone was unfamiliar, but uh, Ecoflora is a community science project that seeks to understand more about the effects of urbanization, make biodiversity data available to everyone, and increase understanding and appreciation of plant life. So the Metro Phoenix Ecoflora is part of a nationwide ecoflora program started by New York Botanical Garden, and it's made possible by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So locally, the project operates within the Desert Botanical Garden and the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance. So using iNaturalist, a completely free and open source web-based platform and app, Project members make observations, and we look at that data to understand more about biodiversity, uh, specifically plant biodiversity here in Metro Phoenix. So we're a community of naturalists. Ecoflora hosts events, trainings, collaborations, et cetera, and we're on social media, also have a monthly newsletter that keeps everyone connected. So the project started in February of 2020, right about the time that COVID began having a large presence in the United States. Uh, and we did as much as we could in that year and the focus was really spent on starting up the project and initiating engagement. So in year two, which was last year, which is why we're here tonight, I was focused on building up the project, increasing engagement, connecting with the community, and of course, making more observations. So there's been a lot going on this past year and we don't have time to dive into everything, unfortunately. And I think many of us have Zoom fatigue anyway. So I'm basically going to play you the highlight reel. So let's look at the numbers. Uh, this is current as of this morning. So 167 people joined the project in year two, bringing the current total to 415 project members. So in year one, we made about 12,470 observations. And in year two, last year, there were 27,331 observations. Uh, that's 14,800 or so plants, uh, 1,000 or so species. And the total number of project observations to date is 40,732. So in the past two years, almost half of all the observations in Metro Phoenix have come from this project. That is amazing. A round of applause for yourselves. That is fantastic. So just to put that into perspective, the total number of observations for all time, including those from non ecoflora members, is about 165,000. So about a third of all Metro Phoenix observations have come from Ecoflora. So take a look at this graph, which is observations on a naturalist over the past five years. And this includes everything, again, non-members as well. Uh, the steady growth can be attributed to more people using iNaturalist in general. But I want you to take a look at 2020 to 2021. So there's a considerable increase that you can see here. And 2021 was the first full calendar year that Ecoflora had been up and running. So what do all these observations translate to? This data and information can be used and is used by scientists for a variety of projects across different fields. And I'll talk about how this project uses that data and information a little bit later. So an important part of the project is EcoQuest. In addition to the overall project, we have monthly challenges to look for certain plants or ecological interactions. And our most popular eco quest in year two was, what's that weed uh, in September? We had a burst of weeds followed by a major abundance of butterflies and moths after the monsoon rains. 
So this is an opportunity to A, teach about non-native and native plants that are considered weeds, uh, and B, to document the butterflies and moths that might use them. So a lot of those weeds are actually caterpillar food. So this gave us a glimpse into a really interesting spike for plant, moth, and butterfly species. Uh, the chart you see here shows the history of butterfly and moth observations again for the past five years. So there's a really huge spike uh, in 2021. So for the EcoQuest, we had about 2,000 observations total, uh, 1860 of which uh, were moths and butterflies, 143 different species of those. And then we had 209 observations of 11 plant species. Excuse me. Uh, something fun related to the EcoQuest that happened this year. Uh, EcoFloor was interviewed by 12 News about the August EcoQuest Look Out for Lovebirds. So this project obviously isn't all about data. We place a huge emphasis on engagement, connecting, collaborating, and education. So we've collaborated with over 40 different community members, local experts, scientists, and organizations, and the majority of which has been within the past year. We've hosted 30 events like eco questions, birding, moth lighting, hiking, and a microscope lab. And these had about 330 attendances total. So we presented for a variety of conferences and organizations, including the annual American Public Gardens Conference, Arizona Native Plant Society annual botany meeting, and for Arizona State University. We currently have about 1,600 contacts for our newsletter uh, and about 1,134 combined followers on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So again, what do all these numbers mean? So this ties back into fulfilling the goal of increasing awareness and appreciation of biodiversity and plant life. So all these numbers represent people that are interacting and learning, and the collaborations show how community science can be used and have an impact. So some of you may remember our April EcoQuest of last year where we looked for cactus. So that EcoQuest contributed some baseline information for what is now the Saguaro Project that is seeking to understand more about wild and urban cactus populations and implications for genetic and urban conservation. This project is led by Dr. Tanya Hernandez at Desert Botanical Garden. In June, I had the honor of advising a local Girl Scout on her Gold Award project, uh, looking at the uh, health of urban saguaros. So this tied in perfectly with the Saguaro project and we are now teaming up. And this May, a collaborative EcoQuest will be hosted with both Dr. Hernandez and the Girl Scout Gold Award project, searching for saguaros, including details on their health and providing location data for future sampling. So I honestly love looking through what everyone sees uh, on iNaturalist and the project, it's really cool. Uh, and EcoFlora is more than the numbers or discovering new species or introductions. It's about the amazing biodiversity we have here in the valley. Um, and it's about interactions and behaviors that we may not have seen before. It's seeing how wildlife and plants adapt to urban life. So the top left here, we have a Lewis's woodpecker, which isn't uncommon, but I had no idea they were here. Uh, and I think they look really cool, uh, kind of like parrot colors for uh, a woodpecker. Uh, below that, we have a violet clouded skipper uh, that was observed by a project member while on a butterfly count. Uh, and this is apparently a pretty rare site in our area, and there's only one or two observations on iNaturalist. So this one might be hard to see, but it's Havelina taking a leisurely stroll on a golf course at night. Um, and then we have uh, an endangered northern harrier here on the bottom. And this is a metallic wood boring beetle here on this creosote. Uh, again, there's only two observations of these on iNaturalist. This wild looking insect down here was seen in a grocery store, uh, which illustrates how iNaturalist can possibly help track species that could be brought in on produce. On the bottom here, on the bottom right, are jumping spiders and what we think is a mating dance or mating uh, ritual. Does anyone know what they're looking at on the top right? You can unmute yourselves if you want to. Any guesses? Pine bark beetle? Nope. So this is a tamarisk beetle. Uh, so they were initially released as biological control for tamarisks and have traveled much faster and farther than expected. And there's a whole lot of implications with that. And I encourage you to uh, read up on it if you have a chance. But a couple of project members observed these near Cave Creek in the Gila River. 
And this is the closest we've seen them to Metro Phoenix. And we're also looking to collaborate on an EcoQuest in the spring when they reemerge to see what we can find and how many we can find. So of course, a couple of plant highlights. Uh, we're not sure what's going on with the two images on the left here. Uh, top left could be some sort of gall on a buckhorn choya. Uh, and something going on with the saguaro cactus, maybe a weird crustacean. Not sure if you have any ideas or know of someone who might, let us know in the chat. Uh, here in the top middle, we have a Florida hammock sand mat. Uh, and it looks like we do not have a voucher of this one in our area, so that's really exciting. Uh, we also have in the bottom here Sagittaria, which looks like there's only maybe one collection here for that. Top right is uh, Butylon doing its thing in an alley, showing how native plants can adapt to urban life. And I just really think these are cool. Uh, this is an aquatic fern, Azola, or a mosquito fern. And there's only about seven observations of those uh, on iNaturalist. So looking forward into year three, We'll be focusing on the research aspect of this project. So we're looking at what's been seen, putting all those observations to work. So you might remember last year we announced the creation of species lists. So we've updated those and now have a more accurate picture to work with, including those 27,000 observations everyone made this past year. So we've got 388 species that have been observed on a naturalist, but don't have observations or specimens in SINET. And SINET is our floristic database and digital herbarium, basically. So there are 1,649 that are the reverse of that. Uh, they haven't been seen on iNaturalist. So while newly discovered species and recent introductions are really exciting, this takes a lot of time. Uh, going through each and every one of those species to prioritize what we want to try and go collect and find could be a full-time job for one person. <laughs> It's like the age old needle in a haystack saying. So this is our biggest focus for this year. So we've also had publications. Uh, we recently published a paper with the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance and are working on another manuscript right now and hope to publish what we find later this year. A city nature challenge. This year, the project is once again co-organizing the CNC for the greater Phoenix area. So this is a global challenge that uses iNaturalist to see which city, our region can make the most observations in a four day period. So last year, our first year that we were in the CNC, we placed 30th in the world. That was really, really exciting. So we're really looking forward to see if we can beat our own numbers this year and see if we can even place higher in the world ranking. And last but not least, we've updated the merit system. If you didn't already know, you can earn merits for your observations. So there's new stuff and it's a little easier to earn bigger merits. Also, the badges are actual stickers this year, not just virtual icons. So you can actually have cool little stickers for badges. So at this time, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our top observers for the year. Feel free to unmute and make some noise and drum rolls for them. So we have first up most observations, George Rourke with 6,524 observations. That is an incredible number of observations. And we have. <laughs> there that we is go. Amazing. So we have something for you, George. We have a membership to the Xerxes Society and a great milkweed grow out poster. And we'll actually hear from George later. He's going to present for us. Uh, next, we have the most species, Julie Stromberg with 681. And that is a huge feat when it comes to individual species. That's really impressive. Go, Julie. Uh, so we have a uh, right in the rain field guide and an eco flora shirt for you, Julie. And most identifications, Steve Jones with 5,182. Way to go, Steve. So we have uh, the book Brother Gardeners for you. And we also have uh, an honorable mention goes to Sawaro for being the most observed species in the project. Um, but seriously, congratulations to our top observers. Let's make some noise for them. Woo! Woo! So I'll be in contact with all of you to get your prizes to you and thank you again. So now we're gonna move on to our guest speakers for the evening. Uh, at the end of each presentation, there will be a few minutes to ask questions and please feel free to put questions in the chat at any point. I'll be keeping an eye on that. So I'll stop sharing my screen. 
And let me, there we go. So our first speaker is Jesse Lewis. Jesse is an applied ecologist who evaluates a diversity of research questions to inform the conservation and management of wildlife populations in the southwestern US. He's an assistant professor at Arizona State University, where he and his graduate students work across the ecologically diverse landscapes of Arizona. Welcome, Jesse. It's all yours. All right. Thank you so much, Jenny. So can you um, see my screen OK and hear me all right? Yeah, you got it. All right. Terrific. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone here tonight. Um, I won't be talking about flora very much, but I'll be talking about fauna and probably a species that a lot of people are already familiar with and maybe have seen out and about while you're looking for flora. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm an assistant professor at Arizona State University. And so I'd like to thank my many collaborators and colleagues over at ASU who have made this work possible and specifically within the CAP LTER at ASU. And also thank my collaborators with the Urban Wildlife Information Network, which I'll, I'll talk more about in just a little bit. So I wanna start out um, kind of thinking big picture here about you know, urbanization and human impacts on the planet. And so perhaps, you know, there's no better image than the earth at night showing lights from around the world. And of course, North America, especially bright, demonstrating substantial human development, urbanization that of course continues to expand. And when we think about urbanization, um, there's many different types. So there's um, a gradient of urbanization we, th we can think about. So we have wildland areas at one end of the spectrum without human residences, and then low density urbanization characterized by rural and exurban development and high density urbanization characterized by suburban and urban development. So we'll kind of talk about this gradient of urbanization concept um, during the talk tonight. And, and thinking about, you know, across this gradient of urbanization, how do wildlife responses vary? And so this, there's a kind of conceptual figure here that we'll return to also during the presentation. But this is looking at population size of, of wildlife on the y-axis. So there's um, very few individuals to many individuals. And then on the x-axis here, we have the gradient of urbanization from wildland areas all the way up to highly urbanized areas. And so first, you know, population size for some species is highest in wildland and low density urbanization, and then decreases in high density urbanization. And these species are often referred to as urban avoiders. And then conversely, population size for some species is relatively low in lower density urbanization and actually increases and is highest in higher density urbanization. These species are often referred to as urban exploiters and then third, population size for some species might be highest at these intermediate levels of urbanization. And these species are often referred to as urban adapters. So like I said, keep this in mind, we're gonna kind of return to this conceptual diagram um, throughout the course of this presentation here. And a species of particular interest along the urban gradient is a coyote. So, you know, which of course is highly adaptable, able to persist or thrive across many different levels of urbanization, is also a focal species related to community interactions with other carnivores, um, you know, medium-sized carnivores or mesocarnivores, skunks and raccoons, and also prey, of course. It's considered a keystone species, that is being a species that's um, relatively important to the ecosystem in some places. Um, where it does keep mesocarnivore populations in check, and that can influence the entire wildlife community and even lead to greater bird diversity in some places. And then of course, human wildlife interactions where coyotes can interact with people, property, and pets. So for all these reasons, coyotes are of, of great interest to the public and to wildlife managers and also to conservationists. And of course, you know, coyotes occur across the gradient of urbanization from wildland areas to moderate levels of urbanization to higher levels of urbanization. So they're really a model species to evaluate 
to try to understand how this generalist carnivore responds to the gradient of urbanization, as well as other landscape factors. And so there's been some work that's looked at coyotes across the gradient of urbanization. Um, so in California, there was some work that was looking at not only coyotes, but a bunch of other species as well. How do they respond to urbanization? And so similar to that figure I showed before on the y-axis, we have probability of occurrence. And so if it's you know, low probability of occurrence or high, and then the x-axis is percent urbanization from low to high, and we'll kind of ignore a lot of these other species, but you can see some increase, some decrease. We'll focus on the coyotes up here in the top, and you can see how there's this positive relationship, so this increasing occurrence with increasing urbanization, um, even at relatively high levels of urbanization. And this is most consistent, you know, with thinking about coyotes being this urban exploiter with their populations increasing with urbanization, which I think is certainly um, how a lot of people view coyote populations as actually increasing with urbanization, as we see here. But it begs the question, you know, are these patterns consistent in other urbanized landscapes? And for example, you know, specifically in the Southwest, in the desert Southwest, where there's a very strong contrast between wildland areas, um, like on the left here, and urbanized areas. So in terms of plant communities and productivity, as well as in relation to water availability. So it's just kind of interesting to think about that, you know, in wildland areas, plant productivity and certainly water during, you know, like the summer season anyways, tends to be relatively low in, in many wildland areas, but it actually can be relatively high in urbanized areas because of our gardens and, you know, all the landscaping and water features that we have. So it might be kind of attractive to some wildlife if they can access those areas to take advantage of those resources. And so to kind of look at some of these questions, the overall objective was to evaluate how do coyote populations vary across this gradient of urbanization? And specifically, evaluate the response of coyotes to urbanization, other landscape factors like plant productivity, distance to water, and so forth, kind of across two scales. The first being the Phoenix Valley, our backyard, and then the second being across a bunch of cities, 20 cities in North America. So we'll touch up on both of these scales here tonight. So first, thinking about the Phoenix Valley, which of course everyone's familiar with, fifth largest city, supports over 5 million people in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And, um, you know, obviously, snoring desert, characterized by being very hot in the summertime with relatively low precipitation, you know, at least um, prior to the monsoons coming later in the summer. And so we sampled the entire urban gradient from highly urbanized in red. So places like downtown Phoenix and Tempe and Mesa and so forth to wildland areas without human development. So, you know, places like the McDowell's, the Tonto National Forest, South Mountain, um, the White Tanks. And then each of these yellow dots um, shows one of our sampling locations where Today, we're gonna to focus on wildlife cameras, but we, have, we had set up bat monitors in these places. We had done some scorpion surveys in these places. But we're gonna focus just on cameras. And so for tonight, we deployed 50 wildlife cameras across travel corridors. We thought animals were gonna travel through. And we had the study design where we had 10 cameras and five stratum from low to high levels of urbanization. Didn't use any bait or attractants. And um, cameras operated from December, 2018 until the summer of 2020 and divided the year into multiple seasons. But for tonight, just gonna to be presenting upon some data that we have from spring of 2019. And so I wanna kind of just show you, you know, some examples of how we characterize urbanization. So we call what's, uh, we use what's called NAEP imagery, relatively fine scale resolution um, data. And so urbanization was defined as built surfaces. So including human structures and paved roads. So hopefully you can see all the, homes here and some of these roads. This is an area over by South Mountain. It's wildland urban interface. And then here's how that NAEP imagery um, classifies urbanization in red. And so you can see even in some of these areas of urbanization, there's also vegetation in green, picks up groups of trees and little parks and so forth. There's some other cover types as well, blue and tan colors here. It gives you an idea of kind of how we're characterizing urbanization. And so here, we kind of saw this earlier, but this is the proportion of urbanization zooming out to the Phoenix Valley from low to high, green being low urbanization, red being high urbanization. 
And so here are 10 common species that, we've, that we see on our wildlife cameras. We see several others as well, but just gonna highlight a few here. So, you know, of course, bobcat and coyote, gray fox, a lot of domestic cats, interestingly enough, especially in the urbanized areas, not so much in wildland. Um, mule deer, roadrunner, gambles, quail, various dove species, black-tailed jackrabbit, cottontail. We also get a lot of javelina, occasionally a mountain lion or two. Um, but so you know, there's, there's typically 10, 12 species relatively, we, we detect them relatively commonly. And so we're gonna look at how that relationship is with urbanization for these various species. And so here on the y-axis again is occupancy from relatively low occurrence to high occurrence and the gradient of urbanization on the x-axis from low to high. And so overall, as urbanization increased, occupancy decreased for mule deer. So they tended to occur in places of wildland or low levels of urbanization. And you know, you're not gonna see a mule deer in downtown Phoenix or highly urbanized areas. And same for roadrunners and gamble quail. Um, they had this negative relationship with urbanization, tended to occur mostly in natural areas and areas of you know, low levels of urbanization. And there was a similar negative relationship for, for bobcats and for black-tailed jackrabbits and for gray fox, where all of these species, they tend to occur up to slightly higher levels of urbanization. But you know, again, you might see a bobcat in an area of low levels of urbanization, especially if it's kind of close to another you know, an open space park, for example, but not in places like downtown Phoenix. And then, you know, what about for coyotes? So, you know, if you think about like, what do you think? Do you think that coyotes also exhibit this negative relationship that we saw for all these other species? Or is that a positive relationship like we saw in the figure earlier from that California study? And, you know, coyotes turns out also exhibited this negative relationship with urbanization. So they were most common in, in wildland areas, moderately common in areas of low to to moderate levels of urbanization, and then uncommon or absent in highly urbanized areas. But they were a little bit more associated with moderate levels of urbanization than other species like a bobcat or like a mule deer. But, but still this overall negative relationship, they, they weren't um, exhibiting an increase in their occurrence as urbanization increased. And so how can we use this information? You know, I'm, I'm really focusing on urbanization here, but we've also looked at other things like plant productivity and distance to water, um, elevation, topographic variables. And based on all that, you can create these predictive maps of habitat use for coyotes. And that can be used to, you know, potentially reduce human wildlife conflict. So here again, this is the wildland urban interface associated with, this is South Mountain as an example. And then we can model predictions of where coyotes are likely to occur. So in green um, is high quality habitat, predicted high quality habitat for coyotes in red areas that they are predicted to avoid. But you can see in the wildland urban interface, there's lots of potential for coyote habitat that's kind of intermixed with areas of urbanization. And the use of the predictive habitat maps for coyotes, it could be used to target people in neighborhoods with a high probability of coyote occupancy to you know, maybe education opportunities to keep your pets indoors, reduce any conflict there, remove any food resources, other attractants where you know, might attract coyotes to a particular property, and then just generally reduce the potential for conflict between coyotes and people. And then what about activity patterns of coyotes between you know, urban versus wildland areas? So when are they active during the day? So in this figure here, the y-axis is activity from low activity to high activity. And we have time of day on the x-axis from midnight to noon to midnight. That solid line is the activity pattern of coyotes in urbanized areas. The dashed line is the activity pattern of coyotes in wildland areas. And this gray shaded area is just the area of overlap between those two activity patterns. So for coyotes, you know, in wildland areas, going to South Mountain or McDowell's or areas that are undeveloped, coyotes are, you know, they're mostly active at night, but also active in the morning, even the middle of the day to some degree, um, and then increase their activity in the evening and again at night here. But in urbanized areas, it's pretty interesting, you know, coyotes are mostly nocturnal. So you don't see them typically in the middle of the day in some of the more urbanized areas. So coyotes shifted their activity patterns to be more active at night in, in more urbanized areas. 
So just kind of summarizing for the Phoenix Valley, you know, they exhibited this negative relationship with urbanization, which indicates they were urban avoiders opposed to urban exploiters. Um, and however, you know, coyotes are observed in many neighborhoods in the Phoenix Valley, characterized by moderate to higher levels of urbanization. And many of these neighborhoods are associated with natural areas or travelways. So although coyotes might use neighborhoods, they use them a lot less than in wildland areas. And when coyotes did use urbanized areas, often they use those urbanized areas at night, probably to avoid any kind of you know, human disturbance. All right, so this second part is a lot shorter, but we're just gonna zoom out to North America and um, look at how coyotes respond to urbanization and kind of wrap things up in the last few minutes here. So this is some work with collaborators with UN, the Urban Wildlife Information Network. So there's partners in more than 25 cities in North America and, and that growing every month. And across these cities, everybody kind of uses a consistent methodology. You can see us down here in Phoenix in terms of setting up their cameras. And so you can make comparisons across multiple cities. And so for the UN cities in this analysis, I just have 17 here. You can see the names over here and where the dots occur across North America. But there's a lot of other ones that I'm also um, considering. So upwards, right now, upwards of about 25 different cities are being used in analysis, but just presenting on 17 cities for right now. And so wildlife cameras, you know, occurred across all these North American cities, sampled the gradient of urbanization. So all these cities have this urban gradient from undeveloped low levels of urbanization to high, higher levels of urbanization. And so across all the cities, there were a total of 636 camera sites. And I'm focusing just on the summer season. And so we'll look at the relationship of occupancy for coyotes with urbanization across cities. And so first down here we have Phoenix. So the same setup we've seen earlier, occupancy from low to high, and then the gradient of urbanization from low to high. And in the summertime, the previous day we looked at was in the spring, but in the summertime, coyotes exhibited this negative relationship with urbanization. Um, and so then it, you know, again, begs the question, what about all these other cities? Is it consistent or are there some differences? But you can see across, you know, all these cities, there's a pretty um, consistent trend where for the most part, coyotes exhibit a negative relationship with urbanization. So we have Austin, Texas, and Chicago, Illinois, Denver, Colorado, Edmonton, Alberta, Fort Collins, Colorado, Orange County, California, Iowa City, Iowa, um, Indianapolis, Indiana, Phoenix, and then Salt Lake City, Utah. And for the most part, you know, you can see this negative relationship. Some cities, it's a stronger negative relationship than others. But overall, pretty consistent relationship, negative relationship. And so just some conclusions about coyote response to urbanization across cities. So, you know, coyotes appear to be an urban avoider pretty consistently across cities. Um, Coyotes occurred across the entire gradient of urbanization, but across most of the cities, coyotes exhibited this negative relationship with urbanization, such as here in Phoenix. And this is most consistent with coyotes being classified as an urban avoider. Um, and so I just wanna make the point, this is ongoing work. So, you know, stay tuned for more results if you're interested in the future, but we're continuing to work in the Phoenix area, um, as well as across the UN network with a bunch of collaborators at these um, within the UN cities. All right, well, with that, I'd just like to thank you for your time and attention. And yeah, if we have some time, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. That's great, Jesse, thank you so much. I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anyone wanna unmute and ask anything verbally? Got a minute or two. I'm hearing crickets. All right, well, if you think of something later on, type it in the chat and we'll uh, address it then. I do have one note. I misspoke. The Northern Harrier isn't endangered. It's critically imperiled here in Arizona. So I just wanted to update that from my slides earlier. But we have uh, next up, Natalie Melkinoff. Natalie is the Plant and Insect Ecology Program Coordinator at Desert Botanical Garden. Uh, she coordinates the activities of Great Milkweed Grow Out, the Garden's Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Conservation Initiative, including the production of native milkweeds and pollinator plants for urban and wildland conservation projects and community science outreach. Her current research is focused on how milkweed physiology changes due to climate shifts may impact how monarchs and other insects use these plants in the future. 
Take it away, Natalie. Okay, thanks, Jenny. Um, I was having a little bit of internet trouble, so if if you turn out to not be able to hear me, just someone let me know. <laughs> I'll turn my video off if it gets uh, troubling. Okay, can everyone see and hear me all right? Looks good. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk to you tonight. Um, my name is Natalie Malkinoff with Desert Botanical Garden and I'm gonna to talk to you about our work with monarch butterflies and milkweeds in the West. Um, so a little quick introduction. Um, the Great Milkweed Grot is the garden's monarch butterfly and pollinator conservation initiative. Um, and we have three main components, propagation of native milkweeds and pollinator plants, outreach and education, and research on plant in insect interactions. Okay. All right, so we have a few butterflies in the Phoenix area that we call the milkweed butterflies, monarchs and queens. And you've probably seen one or both of these around your urban areas or out in the desert. Um, we see monarchs here October through May and queens are here year round. And why do we call them the milkweed butterflies? So milkweeds are the only plants that monarch and queen butterflies will lay their eggs on and that their caterpillars can eat. So they're essential for their life cycle. So let's talk about the life cycle really quickly. Just to refresh, um, an adult butterfly lays an egg on a milkweed plant, a caterpillar hatches out of the egg, it eats and poops and grows, and in a couple of weeks it forms a chrysalis. Um, and a week or two after that, an adult butterfly emerges from the chrysalis, butterflies mate and the cycle starts over again. So we know monarchs need milkweed. What else do they need to complete their life cycle? Um, so nectar resources, adult butterflies need nectar resources from flowering plants. They need non-freezing temperatures and they need shelter, um, both as adults and as you can see in the photo um, and other stages of their life cycle. So monarchs aren't able to get all the resources they need all year round in the same spot. So they migrate. We know monarchs have a really um, pretty famous and well-known migration pathway. So we talk about generally two flyways when we talk about monarch butterfly migration, the Western flyway. So these are monarchs that live west of the Rocky Mountains and overwinter along the California coast. And then the Eastern flyway. These are monarchs that live east of the Rocky Mountains and overwinter in central Mexico. And just really quickly to talk about migration dynamics. So Butterflies are moving south and or west. Um, they get to their overwintering site in California or central Mexico. The same butterflies that made that long journey are gonna stay there all winter long. Um, they're going to slow down their bodily functions, just hang out um, and rest for that time period. And then that same butterfly, when at the end of the winter, when things start to warm up, they're gonna leave the overwintering area, they're gonna mate and they're gonna lay eggs. And then it's going to take three to five generations to get back up to their point of origin. So why are we talking about this in Arizona? Um, Arizona is actually a really interesting place to look at monarch migration. Uh, we have a wide variety of milkweed species. So 30 milkweed taxa in the state, um, which is one of the largest diversities of any state in the West. And we also see monarchs moving through Arizona that are part of both the Western and the Eastern flyway. So if you look at this um, figure on the right, this is from Southwest Monarch Study. Each line on here represents an individual monarch that was tagged and recovered. So physically tagged with a small sticker on its wing and recovered somewhere else. Um, so this figure is from June, 2020. Um, so it represents the fall 2019 migration. You can see that we had about the same number of butterflies moving from Arizona to California and from Arizona to Mexico. So 26 from Arizona to California, 24 from Arizona to Mexico. So an interesting spot that we're in um, for monarch migration. And we have a lot of questions about monarchs in Arizona, um, particularly in the winter. So we have seen some monarchs overwintering here, uh, true overwintering in the sense of not being very active, um, but we've also seen really active monarchs here throughout the winter. We've seen them breeding throughout the winter. Um, if things stay warm for a long time, you know, we have monarch activity um, throughout, throughout our winter. Um, so we have a lot of questions about this, you know, 
what are the cues for this? What are the weather cues or the day length cues? Um, what about milkweed phenology cues? There's a lot we don't know about monarch behavior here in the winter. And we started to get at some of these questions um, with EcoFlora and our February 2021 EcoQuest. So thank you to all of you. Um, and we've been able to sort of expand on those questions through another project that was recently funded in partnership with National Phenology Network in um, Tucson. So this project will allow community scientists to monitor milkweeds closely in their backyards um, for phenology, to collect phenology data and also um, monarch presence data. So we, we just started this project, we're um, piloting it with a few trusted partners, but um, we're hoping to launch to the community in the fall. So if you're interested in monitoring a milkweed in your backyard, um, stay tuned for that. So in general, um, both the Eastern and the Monarch, sorry, the Eastern and the Western Monarch flyways are experiencing population declines. Um, so the Eastern population is much larger and um, Monarch overwintering numbers are measured in terms of area. So um, these numbers are in hectares, which is about two and a half acres. So um, the metric that, that we wanna stay at is about six hectares um, across the years to maintain a stable population size. And there has been a proposal to list monarchs um, as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. They are currently a candidate species, but not um, the highest priority for listing, and that is evaluated annually. Um, so our Western monarchs have also seen very drastic declines, um, down from over more than a million butterflies in the late 90s, down to just 30,000 in um, 2018 and 2019. And then the 2020 numbers uh, were down to less than 2,000 monarch butterflies in the whole state of California. So uh, things were looking pretty grim. And then we got the 2021 numbers in um, just recently. So if anyone's been following this, um, you know, we saw a little bit of a rebound. So almost 250,000 monarchs um, at the overwintering sites in California this year, uh, which is great. It's it's such a great thing to see, but it's certainly not the end of the story um, and it doesn't signal that our work is done. Um, so we, we, you know, this is one year, it's one data point. We hope to see a trend. Um, so we'll be looking out for next year, um, but it was, you know, we've really seen a lot of rallying of, of around the Western Monarch and conservation efforts in the West in the last few years. So um, it's great to see it represented in these numbers here. And we hope that those trends continue. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the research we have going on here at the garden. Um, all of our research questions are generally geared around looking at the best milkweeds for monarch butterflies and other insects. So uh, how do these milkweeds support the insects and how are they going to support them under uh, changing climate regimes? Okay, so um, some of our original research was on monarch preference and performance. So uh, we looked at that map. We have 30 milkweed species in Arizona. We don't know a lot about them. Um, they have um, different defense characteristics, different leaf sizes, things like that, that impact how monarchs are using the plants. So we compared uh, two of our native milkweeds here, Arizona milkweed and pine needle milkweed. Um, and we saw that monarch butterflies preferred to lay their eggs on Arizona milkweed. And if you think about um, what might follow from that, we would expect that we would also see higher larval survival on Arizona milkweed, which we did see. So we see the monarch, um, the female monarch provisioning her offspring with a host plant that's gonna benefit them. Um, and so we also saw higher larval mass on Arizona milkweed and lower development time. So if you're a soft, squishy caterpillar, um, the less time you're out developing out in the open and um, vulnerable to predation or parasitism, the better. Um, we've also looked at some other beneficial insects and our milkweeds. So we're encouraging people to plant milkweeds in their urban spaces. Um, and we're doing, working on these wildlands restoration projects. We wanna know, you know, what else is this plant contributing to the ecosystem? Um, so we had four milkweed species in a couple spots here at the garden, and we collected insect visitation data, phenology data, um, monarch and queen presence data, and pest uh, data over the course of a year. And we found a lot. Um, 
So this is just the information from one month. This is one month's worth of pollinating insects. So this is more than 750 insects we found in the month of April. So this is from April 2017, um, visiting all four of these milkweed species. Um, most of these were flies, um, but there also are another um, number of other groups. Um, and the number of bees and other pollinators is likely higher, but it, we use sticky traps to identify, to capture and identify a lot of these insects. So um, it's definitely flies and hymenoptera are the hardest to identify when they're on the traps because you really need those wing characteristics and those are sort of the first things to, to degrade. Um, the root maggot flies, you can see, we would see a whole lot of these. So these are pollinators. Um, they can also be agricultural pests in some scenarios. Um, and you can see them all on this sticky track up here. Um, we also found a number of predatory insects um, and parasites. So some of these, the tachinid flies and some of these wasps are monarch or queen um, uh, parasites. Um, we also found a lot of flies on here that are predators. So these are an end lace wings. Um, assassin bugs, ladybugs, these beetles, these are all things that are eating things in your garden that maybe you don't want. Um, things like or aphids, spider mites. So super interesting to think about the community of the milkweed here. Okay, I know I'm getting short on time. I'm just going to quickly talk about um, some of our newer research on milkweeds and exploring these interactions under shifting climate regimes. So we are we have built a milkweed common garden here on site that'll allow us to do um, some experiments with these native milkweed species and uh, some drought treatments. So how might these relationships or interactions change under drought conditions? We're also con um, constructing an experimental heating array that'll allow us to get out of this. So the same questions um, under some experimental episodic heat waves. And these questions have sort of started with um, species distribution modeling. So I'm just gonna show this one species, this is Asclepius linaria, it's the pine needle milkweed that we saw um, in the other experiment. And while it's not maybe the best host plant for monarch butterflies, it is certainly a great native nectar plant. Um, and in Arizona in the south, in the Sonoran Desert, we are at the northern tip of its range here. So this figure um, is a little bit misleading because you can't see the southern range. But if you see the red occurrence points um, in the first and the second figure, those, those are actual occurrence points. Um, the highlighted areas demonstrate the probability of occurrence. So it's, you know, it's showing a future predicted range shift moving northward, um, as we might expect. And interestingly, we can see the biovariables that contribute most to this model, um, mean diurnal range, mean temperature of wettest quarter, and temperature seasonality. These are all temperature related variables. So um, it's just sort of a starting point and these models provide a little more information as we look at the right questions to ask when we're thinking about climate shifts and how these um, plants are going to change their interactions with insects, but also how they're gonna move around on a landscape or ecosystem scale. Um, so finally, what can you do about all of this? Um, you know, participating in Ecoflora and these community science projects is excellent. You can plant um, pollinator habitat. You can plant nectar plants, flowering plants that support butterflies and other insects, um, host plants that provide important larval food sources, and you can really develop your urban ecosystem, whether that's in your backyard or in your community. And that's all I have. Sorry, I went a little bit over. Um, if you have questions, my contact info is up there. Awesome, thanks, Natalie. I think we have time for a quick question that's in the chat. Uh, do monarchs and queens compete for resources with each other? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't know for sure. <laughs> I mean, they, they are using the same host plants. There seems to be some anecdotal evidence that they have different preferences. Um, on some level, I'm sure they're certainly competing, um, but they also seem to sort of be diversifying on, on the species a little bit. Um, we haven't done any direct comparison um, preference studies using queens, although we thought about it. They're a little bit harder to get to mate. Um, so at some point, maybe we'll do that and I'll have a better answer. <laughs> Awesome, thanks. Okay, one yeah. more. Are oleander aphids serious pests of milkweeds? 
Um, I'm going to say no. So people get really concerned about them, you know, in their yards, particularly, but just keep in mind anything you do to get rid of an aphid um, could also harm an egg or a caterpillar. And usually it seems like unless your milkweed is under some other sort of stress, the aphids aren't going to do anything to them. Um, we grow thousands of plants here and I don't remove aphids at all and we haven't really had any issues. So. Gotcha. Natalie, would you be okay answering questions in the chat while we move yeah, on? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if you have any questions, type them in the chat and Natalie will answer them for you there. Our final guest speaker of the night is George Rourke. George is a retired electrical engineer and instructional designer uh, who discovered an avenue for his gardening passion through the Metro Phoenix Ecoflora project. And over 6,000 observations later, the project has proven to be an educational journey and a new way to meet like-minded friends and acquaintances. He's now busy creating a website to share knowledge about pollinators and the supporting web of plants and other characters in the low desert. George, it's all yours. All right, so let's see how I do here. Jenny, tell me if the wrong screen shows up. All right, here I we will. go. Are we good? I don't see your presentation. We don't. Let me, oh, wait. How's this? There it is. You got it. All right, good. Hello, all, and thank you, Jenny. Uh, my goal here is to briefly present my journey with the Metro Phoenix Ecoflora program. And uh, I hope the story provides a seat of inspiration to each of you and perhaps permission to take that first step or to keep on stepping. I moved back to Phoenix in May of 2019 after a 15 year hiatus in the Midwest. And I took some classes at the Desert Botanical Gardens. However, two weeks before the second class was completed, COVID forced the course to close. The subsequent months were full of uncertainty, restrictions, and new habits. In June of 2020, a Metro Phoenix Ecoflora announcement appeared in my Facebook uh, newsfeed, and not knowing anything about an iNaturalist and little about our native plant and insects, I reached out to the Ecoflora coordinator. Jenny responded and welcomed me to the project mentioning that, that the first newsletter was coming out soon and I would be on the mailing list. With my smartphone in hand, I ventured out into the backyard and made my first observation. After all, first steps don't have to be big, but they can lead to big things. I had planted a row of hop bush to soften a back wall, having heard that they are a great substitute for the all-present oleander. Hopbush is a larval host plant for the giant and beautiful Cincta silk moth. This species of hopbush turns purple in cold weather then back to green when temperatures warm. From the yard, my observations drew me out into the neighborhood where I discovered desert willows, rush milkweed, and chuparosa. Recognizing there was so much more to our neighborhood landscape than I realized, it became an adventure of observations. Then in mid-July, I discovered a rather modest plant, new to me and prevalent in the neighborhood. Enter the Triangle Leaf Bursage. And Jenny, you, uh, you were part of this uh, <laughs> observation experience. Um, I set a goal to make a census of every Triangle Leaf Bursage in our development. And not knowing the iNatural sap very well, I'd take a picture, upload it to share the observation. This was taking days and I was actually building rock cairns to mark the stopping point every day. Eventually, I discovered bulk upload. After many days, I had reached 500 or so observations, which moves the triangle leaf burst age to the top of the leaderboard for the project. So it started out as a census project, branched out to local parks, and my goals changed. I wanted to capture a wider variety of plants, and began focusing on increasing my observations like a treasure hunt. And then I stepped back a bit and the wonderful world of pollinators came into view. Here are some of my discoveries. After nine months, I had observed a diverse and wonderful ecosystem in our neighborhood and the Apache Wash Trail had 
had next uh, nearby. And 2021 turned out to be a banner year for butterflies. Who knew? With socializing opportunities in the gutter, I decided to put my newfound passion to work and created the visual guide to low desert butterflies and moths. The visual guide contains hundreds of butterflies, moths, host plants, and nectar plants. By September 2021, I was on my sixth revision of the guide and the file had grown to almost 250 megabytes. A visual guide requires pictures, lots of them. At this point, I realized that growing the guide in this format was not sustainable. So I did quite a bit of searching and in December of 2021, decided a website was the answer and started to learn about WordPress. Still a work in progress, the site is growing weekly to contain the information from the visual guide and more. The site has pages for plants, insects, a blog, and even a bling page with free screen wallpaper for your computer or phone. I also started working with Daniel Carlock, who is spearheading the Maricopa Pollinator, Path Pollinator Pathway Project and began incorporating the project's native plant content into the recommended plants page. Recently, another iNaturalist member agreed to be the author of the Bees, Ants, and Wasps page. Elliot Gordon has a wealth of knowledge about insects and the Albuquerque ecosystem. Uh, welcome, uh, Elliot. I think he's on this presentation. And Brooke Dale, Senior Living in Scottsdale has invited me to be part of the new Butterfly Garden product, project. The goal this year is to certify the space as a Monarch Way Station, then expand to additional butterfly species in the future. You don't have to venture far to experience the wonder of our natural world. It's amazing what you can observe in your own yard. Here's some examples from our tract housing development. Gulf Fritillary, Queen Butterfly, Large-tailed Aphid Eater, Metallic Sweat Bee, Bromeliad Fly. So with a step, the journey began, a door opened, I stepped through and got to know the plants and insects around me. On that journey, I met so many amazing people, most virtually, but a few in person. Even with the pandemic and associated social limitations, there are so many reasons to be happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. That's so, so cool to hear about your journey and all of this. It's really great. Thank you. And thank you again, Jesse and Natalie. Thanks for joining us tonight and for sharing your work with us. A huge thank you to all of you attending tonight. Um, I say this a lot, but this project literally would not be what it is without you. And I think the numbers I shared tonight are solid proof of that. You all are amazing. And I'm so looking forward to hopefully seeing you more in person this year and sharing what we find. I've put links uh, in the chat to uh, everyone's work and their pages so you can check those out. I'm also going to put uh, the link to Ecoflora's website as well as our newsletter sign up. If you wanna stay in tune with all stuff Ecoflora and events like this and what we've got going on, highly suggest signing up for the newsletter. It's the central location for all of our information. So we're now going to move into some social time. I know we're at 7.30 and I welcome you to stay and hang out for a little while. Uh, if I can answer any questions you have, uh, we're gonna play some games. Uh, if you'd like to log off, that's okay too. I just wanna thank you again for joining us and have a great evening. <laughs>